So, Diane, maybe we should just begin um, with introducing each other. Um, I am Natasha Perez. I'm a doctoral candidate from Michigan State University, uh, working with Kyle Greenwald on um, this issue of their journal for the John Dewey Society. Great. I'm Diane Richard Allardyce. I'm the co-founder of Toussaint Louverture High School for Arts and Social Justice, where we are now, as well as a professor at the Union Institute and University. This is um, a really phenomenal project, um, so far from what I've heard Thank and you. I've seen. And um, just to, to begin, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how, how you came to teaching and to education? I came to education through uh, university teaching to begin with. I started teaching in 1985 as a teaching assistant when I was a doctoral candidate at the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. And I then became a professor at Lynn University. I started as instructor and uh, worked my way up through the ranks to full professor and ended up being there for 16 years before I left the university to found and, and direct the school. Did you, when you started teaching as a graduate assistant, did you envision that that's where you were going to be for the next 16 no, years? No, I had no idea no? that that's what would happen. But I really became interested when I was a professor at Lynn University in community service. I was teaching mm -hmm. service learning, and I was co-directing the honors program where we decided to get involved with a lot of outreach to the community and to require our students to become activists, mm -hmm. in a sense. We started a, a garden on campus, and, and we had a nature writing um, co-teaching arrangement with, between biology and English, so I was really getting involved in kind of rolling up one's sleeves and getting out into the world as a way of learning and teaching. And I was interested in poetry and went to mm -hmm the Milagro Center where I met the co-founder of our school, Joseph Bernadel, and began teaching poetry in a community center, which mm -hmm. got me even more involved in, in uh, outreach. Okay. And um, so in the community center, who were you working with? What types of people? What were they children? Uh, adults and children. Okay. I was running a workshop for uh, using poetry for growth and healing with adults, mm -hmm. and they were from all walks of life, uh, women and men from several different cultures. We had a um, gentleman from Mexico, we had African American, Caucasian, and Haitian people in that workshop. Then Major Bernadel and I decided to start an after-school program, which mm -hmm. is still running in the community. It's called the Milagro Stars and we were able to create a curriculum and to uh, obtain funding through the Community uh, Foundation of Palm Beach County and the Cultural Council. And I, in that way, we were able to really uh, provide services to the community and to become even more involved in, in uh, educational opportunities in the real world. That's wonderful. And how did you get from there to here? Right. You were teaching at the university. Right. I took a sabbatical mm -hmm. and during that, that semester wrote the charter for the mm -hmm. school. The year before, Major Bernadelle and I had volunteered as co-chairs of a task force for the city of Boca Raton mm -hmm. who, who were thinking of starting a municipal charter school. And I learned a lot by doing that. And when they decided not to open a charter school, I said to Joe, well, this community needs a charter school. I think that we should open a charter school. So we did. We started very small in my house. We didn't teach in my house, but we started uh, by recruiting the woman that you met, who is now our principal, Mandy Friedman. Mm -hmm. She was, at that time, our executive assistant. She came in, actually, to my house. And my, my children, who were teenagers at the time, remember mm -hmm. waking up in the morning and hearing the phones ringing and mm -hmm. hearing Mandy coming to work as we, as we 
put together the, the charter for the school. And you were telling me before about, I had, think I had asked you about, um, was there always uh, the presence of Haitian immigrants or Haitian residents in this particular area? Um, you know, how, how did, did it come to be that this school serves a primarily Haitian uh, population? In several ways, I think. One is that the, the name Toussaint Louverture mm -hmm. uh, marks the institution as inviting to the Haitian okay. people. But I think it really started in the 1980s when the population began to shift a bit here in Delray. And th that's when I came back from the University of Florida to the area and noticed that the demographic had changed uh, quite a bit and that there were a lot of Haitian people. I also noticed at Lynn University that uh, the, the students who were the children of a lot of the, the housekeeping staff and the maintenance staff were given free tuition and I noticed as they were growing up and becoming college age that they had so much wonderful rich culture and insight to, to offer. I really was attracted to the culture and wanted to provide more opportunities for, for students from Haiti and other places. Mm -hmm. And because I met Joe, who was, is Haitian American, uh, he had just recently retired after 22 years in the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. So completely American, and yet mm -hmm. with a, his heart in Haiti, where he grew up. And because we were working together at the Milagro Center, I began to really understand the, a little more of the history of Haiti and the culture and to ag agree that mm -hmm. this was a wonderful legacy that, that needed to be uh, institutionalized in the most positive way. When, when Joe first suggested that we use Toussaint Louverture as the name of the school, mm -hmm. I, I didn't really think that that was a good idea because it was foreign sounding. I didn't think people would know what it meant. Um, I thought the name was too long because I wanted to get art and social justice. Those were my passions into the name. And people told us that school will never fly with a name like Toussaint Louverture High School for Art and Social Justice. But we did it anyway. And I've come to love the name and feel very protective of it because it represents a legacy that is amazing, that it represents a legacy of overcoming oppression against all odds. Uh, it, it, it represents uh, abolition of slavery. It's, you know, an amazing, amazing history. And also Toussaint Louverture himself although he was betrayed and kidnapped and imprisoned in France, where he died in 19, 1803, inspired the birth of a country many decades before slavery was abolished in, in the United States. And to me, this is, a, this is a wonderful story and one that deserves to be known. I think that one of the phrases that Toussaint Louverture said that speaks to everyone, just speaks to all people, is that, that you, can, you can cut down the tree and destroy the branches, but you can't destroy the roots, which to mm -hmm. me is a wonderful metaphor for, for education, that if we provide that good foundation, then we can empower our students to be able to go into the world and deal with the hardships that their lives have have dealt them and do it with dignity and and uh, the kind of leadership qualities you saw in the in the classroom. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I when I visited one of the classrooms, it struck me, and also from something that Mr. Joseph said, I think that um, the teachers here are leaders, and they treat their students as equals. Mm -hmm. um, and the students are also learning to be leaders. And that seemed to be important as maybe a priority of the school. Mm 
So I was just wondering, I was thinking about that and wondering why that is, why everyone is a leader. Is that, um, is that tied into the mission of your school? Yes. Uh, Part of our a vision statement mm-hmm. is that we empower students to be co-creators of a world they can believe mm-hmm. in. That's my favorite part of the, mm-hmm. the mission. Or it's actually the, called the vision statement. Uh, because this is a community and I think the best preparation for adult life is to learn to take responsibility, uh, to take action, to roll with the punches because every life is full of hardship as well as positive Mm -hmm. things. And I think that especially for a a group of people who have been disadvantaged in their youth, Mm -hmm. who have histories of interrupted learning, Mm -hmm. who are struggling with financial challenges that many of us cannot even imagine. They have to be leaders and I think that for them to be able to lead their families, their churches, their communities, their neighborhoods develops resilience and allows perhaps the the only true change that can really happen in the world. So, you know, in reflecting upon uh, Dewey and the concept of vocational education, Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that, you know, sometimes when we talk about vocational education, we we think about um, really discrete um, activities like Mm -hmm. uh, woodworking Mm -hmm. or mechanics. But here, uh, um, you're talking about vocation as a human being. Exactly. Vocation as a person right. and as a community and as a group of people. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's almost taking a step back and, you know, your vocation as a co-creator of the world, mm-hmm. as a leader in your life and in your family's life and in your future children's mm-hmm. life and um, as, as an activist. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that operates on several levels, I think. We do have the, the class in leadership, which mm-hmm. is one of the electives that all students take. And as you saw, it's a, about character mm-hmm. traits mm-hmm. and um, the qualities that that leaders they study had or have and which they want to emulate. Mm-hmm. In the life skills class that you, you visited also, mm-hmm. um, they, they had a field trip recently going to the city commission meeting and speaking at the city commission meeting about a law that was being proposed. It had to do with underage drinking. Mm -hmm. And they came forward to support that law and got up and and spoke in front of the community and the city commission as a preparation for their right Mm -hmm. to have a voice in, in the governance of where they live regardless of their their citizenship uh, we teach mm-hmm. citizenship in in a larger sense uh, cit- world citizenship community citizenship mm-hmm. we also are planning in our next renewal a series of um, activities that you of the kind that you mentioned we are mm-hmm. are hoping to add health care assistant training so that that our students can become CNAs to start with. And we hope to add a hospitality program so that the students from the school can learn not just the the back of the house kind of work, Mm -hmm. but the front of the house Mm -hmm. as well, and learn management skills and entrepreneurship. So that's really interesting to hear, you know, as the, the program continues to bloom mm-hmm. because you know you started with the macro view of of vocation as a person and as a community um, and then it seems to me by being immersed in the culture and learning of the needs of the community and of these particular kids 
um, you're now sprouting programs mm -hmm. that might, you know, that might serve their needs, mm -hmm. which is is really beautiful and it very enlightening, um, because it it's clear to me that there's a focus on the whole person, mm -hmm. um, not just what they can do with their hands or what they can do with their minds, but the heart, the soul, the future, mm -hmm. uh, the past even. Mm -hmm. The parent organization for our school, the, the umbrella organization, is called SETHA, Center for Education, Training, and Holistic Approaches. Mm. So it's interesting you picked up on the idea of the whole person because mm -hmm. that's where we started and how we f first envisioned all the programs that we would eventually develop. Now, SETHA is, is, is the 501c3 that runs the school, mm -hmm. and we also have several other uh, branches of SETHA, including the, the training program in Haiti, which is called Teaching by Heart in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you brought out about the, the heart and the, the whole person is, is very much a part of all of our, all of our projects. So that we think that uh, being kind is just as important as being smart, and having compassion for taking care of each other mm -hmm. is just as important as you know, passing the the ACT. It's interesting because if you look, you know what dominates, um, you know the the dialogue right now in education in the United States is Common Core mm -hmm. and the dilemma with you know, the change of Nickleby and what's coming next yeah. and testing. And, you know, the heart doesn't have a place in there. There is no standard about uh, these these topics. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, in this room where we're having this conversation, um, there's a lot of artwork, you mm -hmm. know, from Haitian artists. And um, on the other side of the room, there are there's some iconography, and artwork um, that are religious images, mm -hmm. religious cultural images from the Haitian culture. Mr. Joseph was talking about them before, and um, that's that's another taboo normally in public school mm -hmm. that you don't bring in religion, you don't show, you know, in such a prominent way. Um, but religion as part of the culture, not mm -hmm. just religion and and perhaps other cult cultural expressions are everywhere in mm -hmm. the school, um, which you know makes me want to ask you about why the arts. How does how does that play into it? Because it's the, you know the name of the school, arts and social justice. Right. As I mentioned, I started with poetry mm -hmm. as one of the arts that <clears throat> excuse me I wanted to bring to the community in a way that was outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. I was teaching as an English professor at the university, but I wanted to really be with people using poetry in a, a living way and ha mm -hmm. having that uh, created. I then helped Major Bernadelle found a after-school program that was based on the arts because the arts can bring people together. You don't have to speak the same language to create mm. visual arts. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a pottery class, dance, and this was a wonderful equalizer. Mm. So when we went to write the charter for the high school, I also envisioned something a little different than we ended up with because it was a learning process for me as mm -hmm. well. Uh, I had children in the in the magnet schools mm -hmm. that the that the Palm Beach County system has wonderful middle and high schools of the arts, mm -hmm. and I thought that was just such a wonderful opportunity that that uh, my children had, but that required you know, years of lessons. It was a mm -hmm. competitive entry application process, and I felt that. In addition to that kind of competitive uh, entry process, there should be an open-ended right. process for everyone who mm -hmm. wanted to be creative and 
use those parts of the self that aren't just intellectual. We learned a lot. I started out having a dance, a dance class, an academic dance class, and we ended up discovering that it was more important to add reading classes in that place because the language skills were, were um, not what they needed to be. So we ended up learning that the, dan the discipline of a formal dance class was not serving our students as well mm. as additional reading classes. Okay. But then we added the, the uh, dance component and now we have a folkloric Haitian dance troupe that meets after school. So it's extracurricular. Uh, okay. um, and they can contract for credit, uh, mm -hmm. for PE credit as okay. well. So, which is an uh, interesting uh, yeah. inter innovation that we've been able to create as well. But the arts, I think, are just a wonderful uh, mm. way of bringing people together. And it, it doesn't always have to be that someone is an artist um, mm -hmm. to practice the arts. Mm -hmm. It's the art of, of being, the art of leadership, the, mm. the art of teaching. And we try to promote the sense that everyone should have a chance to express themselves. So it's like democratization of the arts. Exactly. Where, um, I mean, everybody has a creative side, whether they know it or not. Right. And, and really, anybody can write a poem, um, you know, express their feelings on paper. Mm -hmm. um, uh, perhaps, and like you said, uh, the art of being a leader, perhaps it's about... Um, individual gifts that people have. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I don't want to disparage the formal mm -hmm. arts either. Mm -hmm. I think craft, for instance, in poetry is very important. Mm -hmm. And there are different roles mm -hmm. that a poet can play. You know, a formal poet, a, mm -hmm. a, a, a wonderful person, a uh, who has, who has studied and, and learned from the masters and has perfected the craft and can just really write in a way that brings, uh, as Emily Dickinson said, said uh, a chill to the scalp. Mm -hmm. That's how she, she said she knew a good poem when she saw it as if the top of her scalp became ice cold. Mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was something that she knew was good poetry. So the arts, I think, are broad enough to encompass the formal aspects, the, mm -hmm. the, the craftspeople, the, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the, the person who wants to express herself in a, a less formal way. I'm a, a great ad, ad admirer of, of uh, classic uh, musicians mm -hmm. who spend lifetimes, decades, really getting the, the tone, really perfecting the ear. And yet, at the same time, there's a natural artistry, um, a natural music to the language, I think especially the Creole language. There's a natural rhythm and a wonderful sound to the, to the language itself that brings uh, a real cultural kind of poetry. That's interesting that you brought up the language because in my mind I started, as you were talking about the range of, of artists between those who are more classically trained and have honed their craft to the daily practitioner, maybe who only writes for personal mm -hmm. um, reasons, and I was thinking of language, how language fits that category too. Mm -hmm where there's, you know, the very formal and writing as a craft or even speaking and the daily, mm -hmm. you know, language that right. is usually what our heart is uh, close to. Mm -hmm. You know, it's part of our identity and our culture. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and how is, um, is the Haitian language uh, Creole mm -hmm. incorporated into the curriculum in any way? It is. We offer a class in Haitian Creole for Creole speakers. Okay. So just as we 
offer English for, for English speakers mm -hmm. and English for non-English speakers. So we have a wonderful linguistics professor who's retired from St. Joseph's University, Dr. Ferrer, okay. and he teaches that, which also encompasses teaching about the culture and the origins of some of the the forms of of the words and how to write it, how to how to okay. write and and spell and use use it prop use the language properly. Uh -huh. what, what's interesting to me is that uh, although Creole is is uh, one of the two official languages of Haiti, and it is taught in schools mm -hmm. in Haiti, that a lot of people who live, for instance, in the, in the rural areas, don't learn to write it, mm. and don't often recognize how it's, how it's written. Mm. You know, so it's a wonderful uh, addition to the curriculum. It's a, uh, it's a elective. But we also encourage students to speak in, in native language as needed, Mm -hmm. You know, in the level one beginner mm -hmm. courses, we do use Creole. Mm -hmm. um, in the in the sciences, we, as you uh, met Mr. Flurry, have a, mm -hmm. a Haitian speaker, who Creole speaker, who can go back and forth at will and can explain con uh, concepts in native language as mm -hmm. well as then in English. The student council, interestingly, came to... A, the administration recently announced that we have English only days really? because we speak so much Creole here <laughs> in the school that they feel that they need to practice more English. <laughs> and I thought that was interesting and we talked about the history of the uh, English only movement and how it could go either way. It can go, yeah. it can be oppressive to take away the right to speak one's native language and has often been used, that, that, that power to take away has been used oppressively, mm -hmm. but that if it's a grassroots movement on the student's part, mm -hmm. then it takes on a different dimension and, mm -hmm. and becomes fun to have a, mm -hmm. maybe a series of games even, when, or points, or, or prizes that they want to give for someone who can go a whole school day without, without speaking Creole. But we respect yeah. the language and the culture, and we, we provide opportunities to use both. You know, a couple of words that have come up a lot in our conversation here and throughout the day as we walked around the school, um, I noted were community, relationship, and dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, you know, if you could speak a little bit about those three words and how um, your thoughts on how you know often they came up and I think relationship is the basis for everything and especially in the in in the community sense so that instead of people having authority mm -hmm. uh, over other people we have to have we have to both play our roles. We all bring something to the table, and we have certainly a hierarchy in the school mm -hmm. because it is an institution, and, mm -hmm. and we have to um, work within the parameters of established uh, relationships. But at the same time, we value every person as an individual who can be self-directive. So someone's lack of knowledge about something doesn't make them less mm -hmm. than. And we want to enhance our own ability to learn from each other, all of us. I've, I've learned more from everyone here than, than I could possibly have imagined, and I continue to learn something every day. And I think it's important to really for me to get out of that professor's kind of way of being, get out of the, the uh, system 
And again, for me, it was important to get out of the system by which we have a set of people who know and a set of people who need to know. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we have something that we can offer our students in terms of guidance and knowledge, but in, intrinsically, the relationship that they uh, have with all of us and with each other is, is paramount. We really value uh, mm -hmm. the idea of taking care of each other. Okay. So even when we have you know, a fight, which is rare, that we really don't have many fights here at all between the students, but it does happen. What we try to do is mediate those, and we, we don't punish so much as, um, as we facilitate understanding. Mm -hmm. A lot of times a student has not had the opportunity, maybe, to put herself in another student's uh, perspective and, in, 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 you know, to walk in their shoes. And we really try to, try to encourage that in ways that aren't always done, perhaps at home, um, because we have so many students who are living outside of their families of origin. And because we serve an older population, uh, uh, students who are over age for their grade level, mm -hmm. who are really young adults, they are sometimes uh, independent or renting a room in a house or living with a relative. And they don't have the, the opportunity to develop the same kind of relationship that they might with, a, with their family of origin. Mm -hmm. so, we try to facilitate that kind of feeling of, of family here. Yeah, it, now that you say that, um, I noticed uh, when we were when I was taking a tour of the school school with you, you seemed to know a lot of students by name, and you were able to rattle off how many sixteen year olds, seventeen year olds, eighteen to twenty one year olds, like you knew exactly. Um, so I. You know, that struck me. Mm -hmm. When another thing that struck me was, um, yes, that the age group was mostly 18 to 21. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's not typical. Right. It's not typical of schools um, wanting to do or know anything f for that particular age group. Um, so could you, could you explain a little bit of why that age group? Mm -hmm. How did that come to be? As far as I know, we're the only school in Florida. I know that we're the only one in Palm Beach County mm -hmm. that's, that serves uh, the, the, the group of students who are considered too old for their age group, mm -hmm. or at least in the traditional schools, because of Nickleby. Uh, there's a graduation rate that is based on how many, what percentage of students a school can graduate within four years of the first day of ninth grade. And our students come from various places, but primarily from Haiti, where mo most do not have consistent four, uh, uh, consistent four years of, of high school. It, they don't have that opportunity because of political upheaval, weather, um, mm -hmm. poverty in the rural areas, um, remoteness from schools changes and family structures, so much is going on. And life can be so challenging, so hard, that to go to school for four years mm -hmm. it, straight is, is not the norm. So we have a number of students here who are 18, 19, and are rejected by the traditional schools because they're already uh, not going to be counted in the graduation rate. Right. So the schools will be actually penalized for taking them. They won't take them. Okay. Most of the schools will not take the 17-year-olds who are just coming out of the 8th or ninth grade in Haiti. Mm. So as far as I know, we're the only school that gives a standard diploma to those. And we can do that by, by, by the, uh, with the approval, with the blessing, and within the law because we are graded alternatively as an ESA school. So our gra mm -hmm. graduation rate, you know, does not look good on paper, but that's not 
a true picture of mm -hmm. what we're doing because we're not looking at graduating people within the four years mm -hmm. from the day they started ninth grade, mm -hmm. whether it's here or in Haiti. Mm -hmm. So we can afford to risk that, and mm -hmm. we do risk it. And people can criticize us for having a, a low graduation rate, but that doesn't take into consideration that we graduate people who you know, maybe come back and, and take their FCAT or pass the ACT a couple years after they mm -hmm. have completed their credits. Mm -hmm. So I've been signing diplomas, you know, for 23-year-olds because the law allows that as long as they've completed their coursework mm -hmm. before the age of 21. Mm -hmm. They can come back and sometimes it does take longer to be able to pass the, the, mm -hmm. the reading part of the ACT. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes several attempts. Especially when it's not your um, your home language. When it's exactly. You you you've learned the language at an older age. Right. It takes many years, right. you know, to be able to master that. Exactly. Um, it takes seven years, mm -hmm. at least, according to some of the the mm -hmm. studies I've looked at. But we we don't give the students seven no. years to do it. So <laughs> no, here. No. We have to work within the parameters that we're given, and that is we, we, we only can take them up and keep them through 21, the okay. age of 21. But we're able to allow them to come back and take the, the okay. tests after that. Okay. And we also let them audit the English classes mm -hmm. after that, off the record, kind of. In other words, we don't get any money if they do that, but mm -hmm. in some cases, if They've been with us, and they're part of our family. We mm -hmm. want them to continue learning. Well, it's truly, truly a community school. It I, is. I see that in, um, well, even at 23, or once they've um, left the school, they're welcome back. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we can't call them kids. <laughs> These no. young adults or adults are welcome back. Um, but then even backtracking... This school seems to have grown out of the community um, with the help of, you know, people like you and uh, Dr. Joseph. Um, but there seems to be this reciprocity, community, um, relationship, individuals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that pass through. And the Haitian community also, there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of buy-in, and as at least from individuals mm -hmm. who work here and, and who've contributed. Right. Um, and now we know that there's wonderful things going on here and, and John Dewey would be very, very happy <laughs> to see, um, to see what's going on here. Um, and yet the rest of the world, uh, or at least, you know, bureaucrats have different standards. Like you said, the graduation rate may not look good on paper. Um, you know, what might you say, someone might, might question the rigor, you know, that's a exactly. word that's being tossed around here. Um, you know that's all fine and dandy, but are these students being prepared for college? Right. You know, how will they fare there? Um, but I noticed, you know, common core standards on the boards mm -hmm. in, in most of the rooms. So I see that there is, you know, there's a nod towards that. So how do you feel about that? And mm -hmm. We have to teach to the standards, and we do. And that's been one of our points of growth in the last few years with the help of the charter school office at the school district. Mm -hmm. Three, four years ago when they came in under the current director, uh, Jim Pegg, uh, they didn't understand how we were teaching. And it, it required me to put myself in, look through their eyes at what we were doing. The, mm -hmm. the, the, look through the kind of school district perspective to understand how I needed to lay out the curriculum map in a way that could be understood. Because nobody can take a student that has zero English ability mm -hmm. to passing the 10th grade FCAT in one or two years. Mm -hmm. Some people may claim to be able to do that, and uh, a, a number of school district and state officials have 
have claimed that every child can read on grade level by grade three, but that's not the reality for many mm -hmm. people. It's just not what's going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. We can certainly work toward the standards. But I found the Common Core standards uh, lend themselves, I think, better than the Sunshine State standards did. Okay. And they're more holistic so that we, we can, the big term is unpack, yeah. unpack the standards. And we've, <laughs> we've had some wonderful professional development workshops uh, by people that have come in that we've invited in, and also I've continued that and had workshops with the teachers on unpacking the standards. And in that way, we can look at which aspects of the standards can be taught at which ESAW level, at mm -hmm. which linguistic level, with the goal of teaching all the standards at every level. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in the, in the level one newcomer English class, mm -hmm. we, we are using the same set of standards as in the level four and five English class, but we're delivering it in a different way with different material. Not watered down, but material that's made more accessible through the teacher's uh, accommodation. Mm 